Welcome to the lyric writing class. I'm Lady Leodon Lyon. I'm from Sternfeld in Constellation. And I've only been in the SCA for almost four years, but been adjacent for a long time. Uh, I figured you should know a little bit about who I am. Uh, I've been making music for almost 50 years. And I've got a strong background in songwriting. I've received four Pegasus Awards and the Sam Award. I've got bunches and bunches of albums. And I love playing back up on lots of other people. Um, I'm part of the Sternfeld Rapier Bards. And we hold a biannual slumber party here at my house, which is 10 to 15 people getting together to learn more about songwriting and bard, bardic sort of things. I also teach professionally for the Irish Arts Academy of Indianapolis. I teach Irish language and I teach the Bauron. Um, and I'm in a lot of bands, uh, Three Word Sisters, A Lair, Bed and Breakfast with my husband. It's an Irish duo. I s play with uh, Shauna McGuire and Dead Sexy. And whenever the tools Bauron player doesn't want to travel this far south, I sit in as a pseudo tool. So I want to ground you in a helpful songwriting technique that will allow you to write on any topic. This entire lyric writing seminar grew out of the experience of 20 years ago trying to collaborate with my singer-songwriter husband, Di Gardour, who is also known as Bill Sutton. We both write lots of songs separately, but it's a very different experience when you work as part of a team. At first, it was neither a fun or pleasant experience for either of us. One thing that we learned right off the bat was that the person in charge of capturing the words, whether on paper, the computer screen, or the chalkboard, controls the song. They become the captain of the song, deciding what is kept and what is ignored, and in what order events appear. And that's just a dandy position to be in if you're the captain. It's not such a great place if you're the crew. Uh, in a true collaboration, both partners are seated next to each other in the boat, and each one has an oar, and if both are pulling along evenly, the dinghy will make it to its destination. It's too much paper, sorry. So in order to keep our song ship from sinking and our marriage happy, we employed a brainstorming technique that I'd learned generating programming with the Mythic Imagination Institute, their Mythic Journeys Conference. Uh, our tools consisted of a large whiteboard and different colored markers for each collaborator. And then we set about writing down the first themes that appealed to us and then all the topics that we'd like to write songs about. And through a process of elimination, which we will go into later, uh, we decided on a song that we wanted to write about. We've written several songs using this technique, both collaboratively and separately. And once you learn how to do it, you'll be well on your way to overcoming any sort of writer's block that you might suffer from. So we're going to do that now. The topic of your song. Yeah, so if we were to carry along a building metaphor about this, the topic is the roof under which the entirety of your song shelters. Topics are more narrowly defined than themes, which we'll talk about in a moment. A song can have a main topic and a couple of subtopics, just the same way that a house can have a roof and several dormered windows. So we're going to start out by creating a list of all the things that you would find interesting, beautiful, wonderful, awesome, words and phrases that are funny, scary, weird. Uh, put everything on the page that comes to your mind. And you're going to keep on writing and keep on writing until you have completely filled up this piece of paper or whiteboard or whatever it is that you're writing on with words and phrases. It's got to have no space left for any more words. And at this point in the generating process, there are absolutely no bad ideas. Everything that comes to mind is worth a song. And once the sheet is full, then we'll go get a cup of tea and sit at it and stare at it for a while. And then you're going to circle three of these topics. Don't throw this list away because you're going to come back to it again and again. So you've got these three things you've circled. Transfer them to a new piece of paper. 
And if you're using a whiteboard, take a picture of it with your phone and then transcribe it, transcribe it as a file for later use. Now, if you were attending one of our biannual slumber parties, the entire group of 10 to 15 people would then vote on the top three topics to narrow it down to one topic. Because this is different sort of class venue and you'll be doing this exercise on your own, simply number the three topics in the order of your personal preference and don't throw away that list either. You'll eventually write number two and number three and probably many more from the original list. So take your number one topic and write it on a clean piece of paper or on a fresh board. One of the most important lessons that you'll find from this exercise is that of confidence. Many people find themselves stifled by the fear that they have nothing new to say. Why should I write a song about clouds when Joni Mitchell's already written the perfect song on that topic? Well, because even though Miss Mitchell has looked at clouds from both sides now, she hasn't seen them through your eyes. Your song about clouds will be entirely different from hers, and it will be a perfectly wonderful, valid, and unique perspective on the topic. Why? Because her song about clouds has a different theme than your song about clouds. So with your topic firmly in place, you need to decide on your song's theme. The theme is the overarching meaning that grounds the entire song. If a song is likened to a building again, then the theme is the foundation on which this, the whole structure sits. A song with no theme is amorphous and meandering and a forgettable thing. Themes are very broad in perspective and scope and they cover multiple views. Love, birth, death, jealousy, coming of age, innocence, pride, sin, generosity, the reverse of fortune, war, joy, decline, hope. There are so many themes out there. With all those exciting and varied themes out there, it's odd that 99% of modern pop songs are written by the same theme, love. I encourage you heartily to play with all the other themes out there too. The theme of your song is your choice and your choice alone. If you haven't yet figured out what your song is going to be about, don't worry, it'll probably become more apparent as you get through the writing process. Have you thought about what style of song you'd like to write? There are a lot of song styles and each with a general blueprint that makes it readily identifiable. Just like the walls of that building define the shape, so too does the style create an outward form upon which hangs your lyrics. Is it a ballad, a rap? A sea shanty? Are you going to sing the blues? A love song or a warrior's battle song? A lullaby or a dirge? Opera, anyone? So you have a theme, a subject, and some form of style. What's the mood you want your song to evoke? Think of mood as the paint and trimmings of your home song. Is it a sunny yellow with a bright white picket fence or dark gothic brick and crumbling plaster? And even if it seems cheerful on the outside, is the interior a little more gloomy? Your song can be a combination of moods, but one mood should stand out. A poignant song can include a line or two that brings a laugh. A funny song can express a serious or a sad sentiment. This adds depth and keeps your song interesting. Mood can be set by determining the time signature and the tempo of your song. If your song is set in three-quarter time, is it a slow waltz or a sprightly jig? Do you need a walking tempo of a slip jig in 6-8 or a rocking chair rhythm in a lullaby that's set in 9-8? Will it be a strict march or a jaunty reel in 4-4 time? Want to write a sea shanty? Try a hornpipe in 6-8 with its signature bump, bump, bump at the end of the verse of each refrain. How many voices are singing your song? Is this a single person's apartment or a dormitory? How many people live at this address? Is your solo meant for one lead singer, which may or may not include some background harmonies to reinforce cer certain lines, or is it a duet between two rivals? A conversation, a love triangle sung by a trio, the balanced square of soprano, alto, baritone, and bass, a quartet, a sextet, a septet, an octet, a choir, these choices determine some aspect of your song. 
The solo piece can stand alone without benefit of refrain or chorus, but if you want people to sing along, you better give them something to sing along with, like a refrain or a chorus. The more times an audience repeats lyrics at regular intervals, the stronger and louder they'll be joining in, and choruses are memorable. Now, just how big is this song you're building? How far back does the lot go? In truth, it should occupy no more time than the average listener is capable of devoting to it. Make your song no longer than you absolutely must. Try to avoid writing what we've come to call a pizza song. This is a song that is so long that the listener can call the pizzeria, order a large extra pepperoni, leave, drive to the shop, pick up the pizza, return and enjoy the first slice, and the singer has not yet finished. If you intend to write a very long ballad, an operetta, or an edda, then each verse must be compelling enough to hold your in listeners' attention or they will not journey with you to the end of the song. You'll be able to tell if you've missed the mark and written a pizza song by the number of listeners who leave to get a drink, go find the loo, or come back with a pizza. Silly songs work well if you keep them short. The shorter the better. Three verses and a chorus, in and out, over and done. The exception to this is the Shaggy Dog song, where the lyric drags on and on and on, ending with some horrible pun. Be careful with this style, though. Your reveal must be worth the wait, or the audience will chuck rotten eggs and fruit at you. The timing of funny songs is crucial. The first verse should be funny. The second one should be even funnier. The last verse should be the funniest. And the very last lines should contain the biggest laugh line of the entire joke, or the song will fall flat. A well-made, serious song can be accomplished in only three verses and a chorus, but they do get longer. For the purposes of this class, whether you're going to write a silly song or a serious one, I'm asking you to only attempt three verses and a chorus to start out with. If you feel that your song really needs to be longer, you can add those extra verses in later. Three verses and a chorus, maybe a bridge. That's it, no more. Save the edda for another day. Lyrical houses are built on words. You must choose the right words, the best words, not necessarily the easiest words or the first words that come to mind. Remember that sheet of paper with our topic written on the top of it? From now through the end of class, start to build a list of every word or phrase that you can associate with that topic. Reach for active, vital, evocative words, words that stimulate the senses, that have color and texture and sound and scent and action. There are no bad words on this list, but some will be better words than others. The task is to assemble them all in one place, cram together until you can't fit another word or phrase on the page. These are the words and the phrases which can start to construct your verses, refrains, choruses, and bridges. They're not all the words, of course, but they're going to help start the song construction when you're reaching for ideas and descriptions. This exercise also stimulates the creative juices with one idea ricocheting off another, sending your thoughts into unpredictable and often desirable directions. What should you name your song? In Ireland and Britain, a house not only has a number, but an evocative name that says something about its history. Wembley Cottage, The Compass Rose, Bailey Gate, Downton Abbey. The title of your song is like the name of these houses. Keep your title as short as possible. It must meet a number of needs and it should accomplish all its tasks in six words or fewer. The exception to this is when you're using your title as part of a joke like Christine Lavin's song title, regretting what I said to you when you called me at 11 o'clock on Friday morning to tell me that at one Friday afternoon you were going to leave your office, go downstairs, hail a cab, go out to the airport to catch a plane, to go skiing in the Alps for two weeks. Not that I would have wanted to go with you. I wasn't able to leave town. I'm not a very good skier. I couldn't expect you to pay my way, but after going out with you for three years, I don't like surprises. This song is often referred to as regretting what I said to you six words. Your title. Yep, I'm going to get on to the next one. 
Why isn't it moving? There we go. Your title should fulfill several functions. It must stir emotions, evoke imagery, be interesting and memorable and original. You don't want listeners confusing your song with someone else's song with the same name. The title should make a listener curious and want to hear more. It needs to express some sentiment everyone can relate to, and it should contain or reflect the song's hook without revealing too much. If you want your listeners to have to struggle to remember what your song is, call it, have a difficult time finding it when they need it, then by all means, name your song something obscure and vague. Whatever you call your song, do not give away the punchline or the story ending in the title. Similarly, when you're introducing your song to an audience, just give them the title and the briefest of explanations. Don't tell them all about your song before you sing it. So that's a lot of work for six or fewer words to do. Don't stress out about the title at the outset of songwriting. You need it once the song is done and by then you should have at least a working title. Some titles become more apparent while the lyric is being created and you can always change it later. Very few songs nowadays have an intro anymore, but it used to be a familiar and standard practice. Introductions are not required, but some songs benefit with a lead up. The intro is a unique section, either instrumental or lyrical, that comes at the beginning of the song. In the rock and roll song, Rock Around the Clock, everything that comes before the line, put your glad rings on and join the fun. That one, two, three o'clock, four o'clock rock, that part, that's the intro. It's completely separate from the rest of the song and you only hear it that one time. No part of the melody is ever repeated in it ever again. The intro is often rhythmic in nature and it sets the mood for the rest of the song. I don't even have to sing the intro to the theme from Star Wars and your mind already hears that, sees those words crawling across the top of the screen, but you already hear that dun, 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 that you already hear that. That's the intro. Never heard again. The actual song starts dun, dun, da, 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 but the intro's already been and gone. Until the modern age, many songs contained introductions that were as long or longer than the song itself. The introduction to When Irish Eyes Are Smiling was two pages long, and yet today, rarely anyone ever sings it. They just sing the verse, the one verse. So what is your hook? The hook is the most important thought that people will take away and remember from your song. A song without a good hook is forgettable. You don't want your song to be forgotten, so you do want a hook, a very good hook. Even better, you want the best hook. A hook can appear in the intro, the refrain, the chorus, and or the title. If you want your song to be widely shared and remembered, use your song's hook as the title. Even if you don't use the hook as the title, the hook is what folks will likely use to refer to as that song. So do yourself a favor and use the hook for the title from the get go. So how do you find your hook? Return to that list of words that you've been generating for your topic. Circle five or six of the most exciting words and phrases on the page, not just the ones that catch your eye, but the ones that grab you by your brain and shout, pay attention to me. These words may very well lead you to the hook of your song. The verse provides all of the context and background information. It sets the scene and tells the story. It establishes the vehicle by which the message of your song is delivered. The verses develop and evolve the story or the theme. Just as a strong current steadily pulls a ship out to sea, the verse creates deeper understanding of the main message of the song. The first verse establishes the meter, the lyrical rhythm, the rhyme scheme for all further verses. Rhyme may or may not be used within verses, but once you establish it, it should be maintained. It also sets the type of language and the phrasing that you'll use throughout this song. 
the rest of the verse continues to ride on that same current. Modern and pop dance songs sometimes only have one verse and a chorus that are then repeated endlessly. Those songs really depend upon melody, rhythm, and performance in order to be successful. But most other songs commonly have multiple verses, each composed of several lines. Three to six verses is good. Anything longer starts to border on pizza song territory. A refrain is a part of the verse that is repeated at certain points throughout the song, one or two lines in duration, often used with the main lyrical hook or title. The melody and the rhythm of the refrain are part of an extension of the verse melody and the rhythm of the singers and listeners might forget some or all of the words to the verse, but a refrain with its incorporated hook really sticks in the memory. A good example is found in the vaudeville music hall song with her head tucked underneath her arm. That memorable hook phrase is repeated at the end of each verse and several times throughout the chorus as well. A special type of refrain is known as a chorus and people very often times confuse refrains with choruses and vice versa. They think they're the same thing, but they're not. They're very different. Like a refrain, it can and most likely should contain your song's hook. If you notice in the previous example with her head tucked underneath her arm, the chorus differs from the refrain as a distinct section using multiple voices. The chorus's melodies, uh, intensity, and sometimes even the rhythm are noticeably different from that of the verse, making it a distinct eight bar section. It can be longer, but use restraint. The verse chorus song form is often represented with the verse as A, the chorus as B, and you'll see it listed as ABAB, even though it'll go on for far longer than that sometimes. A musical bridge does just what the name implies. It allows the listener to travel away from the main road to an interesting place. A bridge is a portion of the song that heard alone feels incomplete. But when properly placed in the context of the song, it connects two primary musical themes. The bridge gives the listener a break from the main themes of the song. Usually, but not always, a bridge will return to a chorus section. It should sound different musically from both the verse and the chorus. It can contain lyrics or be completely instrumental. Usually, the bridge section is inserted after the second chorus. This is often the point in the song that the listener is ready to hear something new. Some songs may place the bridge in a different location, often for lyrical reasons. Musically, the melodic bridge uses subdominant harmonies. If the verse and the chorus share the same harmonic structure, the bridge moves to an alternate melody and a harmony pattern. It breaks up the sections of the song and keeps the verse and the chorus fresh and interesting. You might choose to add a bridge to your verse chorus song for several reasons. To break up the repetitive back and forth effect of an ABAB verse chorus song form, to extend a short song's length, or to include necessary lyrics that move the story forward using the verse theme. But we're gonna focus just on the lyrical bridge, also known as a transitional bridge which moves the story message away from a primary plot to a subplot and then back again. It's typically shorter than the verse. It should contain some sort of twist, uh, some kind of help that makes sense of a complicated plot. It examines an unexplored but significant side story or a character point. It asks or answers a question posed in the title or the first verse or asks an entirely new question altogether. The, the bridge is taking you to a subplot, something that isn't going to take over your, sor your song's story, but you still feel is necessary for people to know about. The lyrical bridge shifts the focus and brings something into focus. It may alter or distort the meaning of your title or your hook. It can even change a previously well understood link between the message, the hook, and or the verse turning a song in a completely new direction. Not all songs incorporate a bridge. Only build one if your song needs one. 
a very important thing about the transitional bridge, when you take your listeners across a transitional bridge, don't forget to bring them back to the main road. They have to come home or the song can't get finished. An instrumental solo can take the same position as a bridge. Generally in the same key structure, a solo or a break offers an opportunity to showcase an instrument or a voice improvising on a melodic theme of the song. It can represent a passage in time. It can pad out a very short song. And oddly enough, it can help a too long song become more listenable. The solo or instrumental break gives an audience a chance to rest their concentration and process what they've heard in a complex and involved plot. A collision is a section where different parts of music and lyrics overlap each other. Collisions don't tend to last very long and they usually occur towards the end of a song. They create tension and drama. A common source of collision themes colliding with the chorus theme are the middle eight and the pre-chorus melodies. Fugues and rounds where a melody line is introduced and then and repeated or imitated by other voices or instruments contrapuntally interweaving are types of collisions. And some of the best examples of them, Stephen Sondheim's showstoppers feature what seem to be unrelated melodies from individual songs whose roads he then runs together in complex intersecting collisions. He masterfully exhibited this technique with Leonard Bernstein's music in West Side Story by ending the Tonight Quintet Chorus with a superb collision. You can hear another version of it in the now, later, soon collision in A Little Night Music. The coda, coda is Italian for tale. And these are the closing lines of a song, bringing it to an end. It's not uncommon to, to include aspects of both an ad lib or a collision section. The coda is an optional addition to a song. Pony and Vixie's A Girl Who's Never Been ends with the coda and he faded and has a completely unique melody to it and is completely extraneous to the song. Kind of creepy Cheshire Cat peek at what she's experiencing. So it, it makes a great coda. Lyrics versus poetry. What makes a lyrics can be read as poetry, but not all poems make good songs. You can write blank verse or free form verse. You can turn that into a song, but it will be very hard for a singer to memorize it. And it'll also be very difficult for a listener to follow along. Good songs require structure, and that comes in rhythm, meter, and rhyme. So let's talk about meter first. We often talk about the ways in which storytellers and bards and their vast repertoires of memorized material stun a crowd of people. That how in the world can they remember all of that stuff and put it together? The trick is that there is a structure that's provided with mnemonic advantages because those reduce the possible next word or line from an infinite number of combinations to those few that will fit the expected scheme. For Western languages, we might expect those structures to include a specific, specific number of syllables in a line, quantitative meter found in Greek and Latin poetry, and a specific pattern of stresses within those syllables. Lyrics, like poetry, are measured out in metric feet. The word foot is a translation of the Latin term pes, uh, the plural is pedis, which is in turn a translation for ancient Greek words, which I cannot pronounce because I don't speak Greek. The ancient Greek prosodists who invented this terminology specified that in order to beat time or march or dance, a foot must have both an arsis, a place where the foot is raised, and a thesis, a place where the foot is lowered. The metric foot is comparable to a bar 
in music notation. This repeating rhythmic unit forms part of a line of a verse. The unit is usually composed of two, three, or four syllables in length, and the most common feet are the IM, trochee, spondy, anapest, dactyl, and pyrrhic. Now this is uh, a table that I've put together from meter and poetry and verse by the coming study guides that shows what all of these different meters are, starting with the I am, the unstressed stressed, it has two syllables, but soft, what light through yonder window breaks, that ba dum ba dum ba dum The trochee is stressed and unstressed, also two syllables. If we shadows have offended, think of this and all is mended, stressed, unstressed. The spondy, stressed plus stressed, is also two syllables. Cry, cry, Troy burns, or else Helen go. Anapest is unstressed plus unstressed plus stressed, three syllables. In March sow thy barley, thy land not too cold, the drier the better, the hundred times fold. Dactyl is stressed plus unstressed plus unstressed, again three syllables. Mournful melopone, assist my quill, that I becomingly may wake my will. And pyrrhic, unstressed and unstressed, when the blood creeps and the nerves prick. So the length of the lines and thus of the meter can also vary. And the following are types of meter and their length lines. You've got a monometer that's one foot, a diameter, two feet, trimeter, three feet, though going all the way down to octameter, eight feet. Meter is determined by the type of foot and the number of feet in the line. So for example, a line with three iambic feet is iambic trimeter. A line with six dactylic feet is dactylic hexameter. Valid meter, which we use a lot in the SCA, is made up of alternating lines of iambic tetrameter and iambic trimeter. Heroic meter, which is also called epic meter, is dactylic hexameter. Typically, the decision of whether a lyrical work is prose, poetry, or song depends on how strictly it follows repetitive structures and can be matched to a melody. It's certainly possible to create a song that has no repetitive meter or rhyme, but most listeners and musicians will find it difficult to remember and reproduce without some tools like sheet music. So where do you start? Well, with your hook, of course. It's the most important line in your song. It's going to be the most repeated line of your song. So write it down and repeat it over and over and note where the stressed and unstressed syllables fall in your natural cadence of speech. So for the sake of this class, let's pretend that we're writing a song with the title hook of Yankee Doodle Dandy. The metric pattern for the syllables in Yankee Doodle is trochaic, stressed, unstressed. Yankee Doodle. The downward slash indicates a stressed syllable, the long dash an unstressed syllable. The trochaic pattern of this phase strongly suggests that the song you're going to be writing in is going to be in 4-4 four, four time, which is four beats to the measure, and a quarter note gets one count. If we were to write out the entire verse of the song, the meter map for Yankee Doodle would look like this. You can see the stress marks and the unstressed marks. This is your metric map. When you're planning your own metric map, I encourage you to use three lines for every line of verse. The first is for the stressed unstressed syllable marks. The second is for the actual line of the verse. I've marked the stressed syllables in additional bold and unlined text. And the third line is left blank for changes and corrections. There will be changes and corrections. What do we mean when we say that a line of a song does or does not scan well. Within a song lyric, consistent application of meter is known as scansion. The operative word there being consistent. If we say that a line scans properly, we mean that it fits a metric pattern that matches the accompanying melody. This doesn't necessarily mean that the meter is carved in stone. Some changes in the pattern of one song can be compatible with the melody written in another song. 
Learning how to keep the meter strictly consistent in the beginning ensures that future variations are done purposefully. Try to avoid shoehorning or crowbarring words or phrases into your song with no thought as to how they will sound within the melody. Proper scansion is critical to writing good parody. Don't put the emphasis on the wrong syllable. And I can't stress this often enough. Follow your metric map. It helps to identify where the stress should and should not go. English is a very stressed language. Pronounce each line slowly and out loud. Notice where the cadence naturally falls. If it doesn't match your metric map, you need to find another way to express that thought so that it fits. Nobody ever said that songwriting was going to be easy, but people who sing songs will thank you for removing this stumbling block from their musical path. Now, going back to Yankee Doodle, you can have variations. I've got the first side of the metric map on the left-hand side, Yankee Doodle went to town. But then when you get to the second verse, that first line, father and I went up a hill. Father and I does not seem to fit the metric map of the first line. The line still scans though, because the extra unstressed syllable fits the measured bar of music. If instead of father and I, we try to squeeze father and Aunt Fanny and cousin Jedediah and I into the same space, the line no longer scans. And if at the end of the line, we try to jam Captain Stanilopoulos in place of Captain Goodwin, we create a hurdle over which every future singer and listener must struggle. Inconsistent scansion makes it difficult to find and link a melody to a lyric. The closer you match your lyric to the metric map, the easier time people will have learning and singing and listening to your song. Don't create hurdles that listeners and future singers will struggle to leap over. Fill in the pitfall so others don't find your lyrics a misery to sing or listen to. Your job as a songwriter is to make your song accessible. Once you've made a metric map of the first verse and the chorus of your song, use it to draw an outline for the rest of the verses, leaving spaces for the lyrics that you have yet to write and extra blank lines for corrections and changes. This will help you keep your focus and reach for words and phrases that fit within your future melody. There are two kinds of songwriters out there. Those who hear the music in their heads and heart and then work to find the words that fit them. And those who write the lyrics first and then compose a tune around them. If you're a songwriter who composes a melody first and fills in the lyric later, your melody strictly enforces the creation of that metric map. If you're following an accepted song form and you know where the hook is going to be placed, you can fill those lines in and see your song is already fleshing out already. If you'd like a fun exercise, make a metric map of a familiar song. Remove all the words and then use it as a guide to create a new and different song. Parodists do this all the time. Very good parodists not only keep a metric map, but a thought map and a story map as well, substituting the twist in the pattern that is same as in the original song. Feel free to use this technique to create your song. Your rhyme scheme is your rhyme scheme. You pick the pattern that you like. The second and fourth line, fine. The first and fourth and second and third rhyme in the middle, great. Every line, it's hard to do, but you go for it. But make every verse match the first rhyme pattern. Listeners will notice if you deviate. Play with your words. Try to incorporate internal rhymes and alliterate consonants and use some onomatopoeia. Have fun with it. Your rhymes don't have to be exact. Don't make yourself crazy hunting for a perfect rhyme. They just have to be close enough. The brain will forget the details of the word you're trying to rhyme and be satisfied with the overall shape of the word you do find. The word partner doesn't exactly rhyme with hardener. Panther and dancer don't match internally, but the shape of the vowels is similar and nothing rhymes with orange. Have you ever seen a house that was built in one age and then has an addition after an addition cobbled on in a different style with different materials? Those pitiful structures have had their architecture muddled. Songs can get muddled too. 
whether for silly or a serious song, every line of every verse and chorus must refer to your theme and topic in some way, whether through story or character, symbol and sentiment. If you can't find the theme or topic in the line, then that line must change or go. With no direct or even indirect reference, what you've got is padding, fluff, insubstantial, blah, blah, blah. With each word, ask yourself the hard question, could the song hold together without this? If it can, take it out. If it can't, keep it. Unless you're doing it on purpose and for a very good reason, try not to use the same nouns and verbs in the same song. With so many words from which to choose, why use the same one twice? Most of the time, you don't even notice that you've done it. But you have such a limited amount of time. Three verses and a chorus. That's not very many words, so try not to repeat them. Read your lyrics out loud and in reverse order. Those duplicates will come leaping out like salmon swimming upstream. Circle them and then decide which one stays and which one goes. Here's your chance to replace a doppelganger word with another vibrant descriptor, one that evokes a slightly or largely different emotion. A scent, a scene, a taste, a sound. How many different words can you think of right now to describe the sound of flowing water? Find the best words, and that's the challenge, but also the great fun of songwriting. Clichés were once original and witty the first, second, or third time they were used. Now they're old hat and you don't want them in your song. Why? Because they present your listener with an opportunity to stop really listening to your song. The subconscious says, oh, I've heard this before. Nothing new here. Probably nothing new coming either. And it moves on to other things like the shopping list or the bathroom or the hard chair beneath your right bum cheek. You don't want to give your listener the chance to think of anything except what is coming next in your song. So examine your song for cliche phrases. Is it trite? Is it overused? You have two choices. Replace it or bend it in a different direction. There's one place where cliches are helpful and that's when seeking a hook or a title. But once again, the trick is to take the cliche and toss it on its ear making it fresh and witty again. Country Western song titles often use cliches and they rework them in this way. Pick me up on your way down. Two of a kind working on a full house. I've got friends in low places. Don't settle for easy rhymes. Offenders include lines that end in I-F-E, if, because there are so few of them. Wife, knife, life, rife, and the worst of all, strife. How many times have you heard the phrase, cuts like a knife? My darling, my wife, the love of my life. How many times in actual normal conversation do you ever use the word strife? Honey, I had such a hard day at the office. It was so full of strife. It's an archaic word from a bygone era. Now, if you're trying to write a song from a bygone era, then by all means, throw in some strife. But otherwise, that word sounds stiff and forced and out of place. If you must use if words, place them in the beginning and the middle of the line rather than at the end. Refrain you must from sentences you are twisting or else mess of your lyric create you will. The more natural sounding your lyrics come out of the singer's mouth, the easier they will rest in the listener's mind and remain in their memory. In your search for that elusive word, please refrain from twisting your sentences into odd, contorted, snarled messes. We've come to refer to these verbal knots as Yoda speak. When 900 years old you reached, look as good you will not. Powerful you have become, the dark side I sense in you. Through the force, things you will see. It destroys the line of thought, contorting and it, it contorts the natural order of your sentence. Yoda's speech is a high hurdle you don't want to build into your lyric. 
don't make the poor listener have to chase through the storyline over hills and under bushes to make a hound after get after that rabbit. They'll soon tire of the mental maze that you're making them run through and they will stop listening. Try to keep your lyrics in an active voice. Passive voice obscures and dilutes the sentence. It happens when the focus is on the action rather than on who or what performed that action. So Gerald's horse was stolen. That doesn't tell you who stole the horse. Well, I stole Gerald's horse. That's active. A mistake was made, but you don't know who made the mistake. He made a mistake. That's active. A letter has been written by Renee. Lene, Renee wrote a letter. The sheriff was shot. I shot the sheriff. Be very careful with the word did. Often inexperienced songwriters try to fill a vacant syllable with it. My lover loved me so, so off to church we too did go. No, 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 no. There is so much wrong with this couplet. But for this example, the two lovers didn't did go, they went. Go rhymes with so, but it does so in a very poor and awkward way. Did anything is almost always the easy rhyme, the lazy, thoughtless rhyme, the soft and well-worn road. Some writers also use did this and did that to try to make their song sound old and archaic. So is there some poor place for, for did in good songwriting? Yes. If you're stating something with conviction, he really did go to the opera. I swear this is so. Or if you want your lyric to sound reminiscent of a song from a language like Irish or German where the phrase did go and did sing and did die are normal. From this point forward, you may find yourself wincing every time you read a lyric or hear a song with an incorrectly or poorly used did in it. Sorry. Once your eyes and ears are open, there's no going back. Be careful of overusing place saver words like just and so and well and oh. When you see or hear them crop up, think of them as the equivalent of um or like. You can use them, but do so intentionally. If you were like writing in like the voice of like a hesitant or like an experienced youth or like a valley girl. Using them as padding or filling is not acceptable. So you're going to listen to songs very differently now because you want to write songs. There are songs I can no longer sing full-throated because some verbal clam clenches my throat. I find myself singing in a different word sotto voce or not singing the phrase at all. Bad lyrics make me wince internally and really horrid ones externally, especially bad hymns, which often began their musical lives as doggerel poetry and shudder. But hopefully now you are armed with some tools that you can use to write your song lyric. If you had attended Slumber Barty, this is the point where I'd be sending you off to your corner now to create your three verses and chorus. And tomorrow, after a full Irish breakfast, we'd respectfully lay your work on the altar of the first draft. That's not possible in this format, but I'm still happy to help you polish any lyrics you come up with. Once you have something you're willing to have someone look at, please feel free to contact me at leodon at bsutton.com. And if you're willing, we'll give it a once over lightly. I only offer suggestions and I try to do so in a painless manner. I want your songs to shine almost as much as you do. <laughs>